In 1993, Christopher R. Browning published this book, Ordinary Men, Reserve Police Battalion 101 and the Final Solution in Poland. His book here chronicles the activity of a German police battalion of middle-aged men who were brought in behind the main army to maintain order and to enact Nazi policy in occupied territory. And after being in Germany, they went to Poland, and that's where most of the things we have here happen. Uh, this book is pretty rough reading. It's pretty intense material. You may not feel like eating after you read part of this. They went there and they were ordered to slaughter Jews in a city called Yusufuf and in other cities. It was responsible for the murder of more than 86,000 Jewish citizens in World War II. Now this book seeks to discover what happened in that unit and, and what made it possible for these rather ordinary men to become cold-blooded killers of men, women, children, and even babies. Brown chronicles a long list of atrocities. Uh, the battalion was engaged at various times in forcing Jews to board trains for transport to death camps. Often as many as 200 Jews would be crammed into a single railroad car. When they unloaded them at the other end, a fourth of them would have died en route uh, because they were just stuffed in just as tight as could be and many of them died there. The first large action was a, a slaughter in the city of Yusufuf. Although Von Trapp was visibly shaken and repulsed by the orders that his unit was ordered to carry out, his offer for men to be excused from the action resulted in what? Only about one dozen out of his 500 policemen uh, sought to be excused from the action. So almost the whole battalion went ahead and engaged in the shooting, the indiscriminate slaughter of civilians. So Browning recounts several of the excuses given by the shooter policemen, including uh, one's belief, for example, that the Jews would not escape anyway. And so uh, he just went ahead and shot them. Another reason this way. So here's what he said. What is clear is that the men's concern for their standing in the eyes of their comrades was not matched by any sense of human ties with their victims. The Jews stood outside their circle of human obligation and responsibility. Such a polarization between us and them, between one's comrades and the enemy, is of course standard in war. And in the original German, that word release also kind of means redeem. So it's kind of a creepy thought here that there was something good about killing the child. But this person reasoned with himself, and that's what, what he came up with. Grim, very grim. Now, after the executions they accomplished in that action, many of the policemen were demoralized and, e and even heartbroken. But changes were soon made, and a division of labor was made. Quoting again from Browning, the bulk of the killing was to be removed to the extermination camp, and the worst of the on-the-spot dirty work was to be assigned to the Tronikis. Uh, those were SS-trained auxiliaries from Soviet territories, and they were recruited from prisoner of war camps. Going on, Browning says, this change would prove sufficient to allow the men of Reserve Police Battalion 101 to become accustomed to their participation in the final solution. Oh, boy, this is grim, isn't it? Now, some of the actions involved moving Jews from one location to another, but some of them were, were ill in a ghetto hospital room, and they were inconvenient to move. So let me tell you what happened next. I'm sorry about this. It's just gruesome, altogether gruesome, but here's, here's what he said. A group of five or six policemen was assigned to enter the room and liquidate the 40 or 50 patients. Most of them were suffering from dysentery. And he goes on to say, the policemen opened fire wildly as soon as they entered the room. Under the hail of bullets, bodies toppled from the upper bunks. One participant said, at the sight of the sick, it was not possible for me to shoot at one of the Jews, and I intentionally aimed all my shots wide. You just would hope we wouldn't have to ever go back and think about this. But if we don't think about it, you know, many of these things will happen again. They'll happen on our watch. Now, the book records a large number of unimaginably evil murders. And I'm skipping most of the content for you, so you can at least thank me for that. Anyway, let's go to the conclusion. But what about the totals? And let me share with you what they say about the totals. At the conclusion of the Erdtefest massacres, the district of Lublin was, for all practical purposes, Judenfrei. Judenfrei means Jew-free. Murderous participation of Reserve Police Battalion 101 in the final solution came to an end. With a conservative estimate of 6,500 Jews shot during the early actions, like those at Yusufuf and Wamaze, and a thousand shot during the Jew hunts, and a minimum estimate 
of 30,500 Jews shot at Majdanek, Poniatawa, I'm sure I mispronounced it, the battalion had participated in the direct shooting deaths of at least 38,000 Jews. With the death camp deportation of at least 3,000 Jews to Mianzirzitz in early May 1943, the number of Jews they had placed on trains to Treblinka had risen to 45,000. For a battalion of less than 500 men, the ultimate body count was at least 83,000 Jews. Now, the closing sections of the book attempt to understand how men could do these deeds. Some observations included are these, quote, War, a struggle between our people and the enemy, creates a polarized world in which the enemy is easily objectified and removed from the community of human obligation. Here's another one. Normal individuals enter an agentic state in which they are the instrument of another's will. In such a state, they no longer feel personally responsible for the content of their actions, but only for how well they perform. Once entangled, people encounter a series of binding factors or cementing mechanisms that make disobedience or refusal even more difficult. The momentum of the process discourages any new or contrary initiative. And here's another one. Quote, people far more frequently invoke authority than conformity to explain their behavior, for only the former seems to absolve them of personal responsibility. And here's another one. Ideological justification is vital in obtaining willing obedience, for it permits the person to see his behavior as serving a desirable end. And one more, quote, overarching ideological justification, and this is referring back to Stanley Milgram's experiments, was present in the form of a tacit and unquestioned faith in the goodness of science and its contribution to progress. So now, friend, Browning offers this conclusion, quote, the collective behavior of Reserve Police Battalion 101 has deeply disturbing implications. There are many societies afflicted by traditions of racism and caught in the siege mentality of war or threat of war. Everywhere, society conditions people to respect and defer to authority and, indeed, could scarcely function otherwise. Everywhere, people seek career advancement. In every modern society, the complexity of life and the resulting bureaucratization and specialization attenuate the sense of personal responsibility of those implementing official policy. Within virtually every social collective, the peer group exerts tremendous pressures on behavior and sets moral norms. If the men of Reserve Police Battalion 101 could become killers under such circumstances, what group of men cannot? And that's quite the question he asks. This is truly a, a chilling book. It's really chilling. These were not young men raised under the radioactive glow of Nazi ideology, but these were middle-aged men whose values were formed many years before the rise of Nazism. And yet, most of them were transformed from reluctant participants at the beginning into efficient murderers. Now, friend, this is no theory. It's not an experiment. Battalion 101 existed and killed on a grand scale. Very disturbing indeed. From a Christian standpoint, we understand men are born with damaged natures, fallen, if you will. Humans were designed to be holy, healthy, and happy, to be outward focused, to facilitate the good of others. Instead, we are bent inverted, we develop into who we are and become self-seeking, self-serving individuals. The Bible says God made man upright, but they have sought out many schemes, Ecclesiastes 7.29. And also in the book of Ecclesiastes, it says that of us that madness is in their hearts while they live. That's chapter 9, verse 3 of Ecclesiastes. Are we Christians afflicted also with polarization? Just kind of looking at that list of things that I, I grab, put out there in emphasis to you. Are we also afflicted with some polarization? It seems, it seems we are. Other authorities have our hearts. It's, it's urgent that we be a people returning to the Bible. Very urgent. What about where Browning mentioned momentum? The issue of momentum, agentic state, and entanglement. That troubles me. Because think about it, how speedily the church has complied with arbitrary government rules and closures during the year 2020. There was... Not very much reflection, but there was kind of an instant and even hypnotic recitation of government talking points. I mean, it was boom. The church was doing just what they were told to do. You know, close. Okay, we're closed. Stand on a dot. Okay, we're standing on a dot. 
uh, do this. Okay, we're doing this. It, it, was, it was almost robotic. It was as though they had left behind the religion of Christ for the religion of scientism. Because, of course, remember that what we kept being told in that time, that everything was being done because science, science, science. So there were some issues there that revealed some, maybe some issues in the church. The human machinery, it seems, is not difficult to weaponize for other agendas and other ends. If we continue unvigilant, we will be no more than salesmen for dehumanizing agendas. If we have any desire at all for freedom, we must return to the only person who can make us free. Jesus can transform our hearts. That is the project of the gospel. To turn cowards, compromisers, conformers, and bullies into free men and women who love the truth and respect liberty for others. My heart can be, it must be, supernaturally transformed or I am only an executioner in waiting like the men of Battalion 101.